Welcome to another episode of Degenerate Imbecile Theater Presents Poets Showcase. Well, hello. My name is Pompous, but you may call me Mr. Arsh. Welcome to another edition of Degenerate Imbecile Theater Presents Poet Showcase. This edition, we will focus on the works of Mr. Walt Whitman. With us today is self-proclaimed expert of the sound of one hand clapping, Mr. Michael Bacora. Hi. Now, Mr. Bacora, are you an expert on the work of Mr. Whitman? Hi. Right. Well, moving along. As Robert Hudspeth would state, Walt Whitman was the man who revolutionized American poetry. He invented a whole new poetic form, and he opened up topics to a wide range that nobody else would touch. Some also thought that he was in the movies Lord of the Rings. This, however, is not true. What could it have been that inspired Mr. Whitman to create a new form of poetry? Let us listen to the words of Mr. Robert Hudspeth and Mr. William R. Hanley as they describe for us some of the aspects of Mr. Whitman's life. Walt Whitman was the man who revolutionized American poetry. He invented a whole new poetic form and he opened up topics to a wide range that nobody else would touch. Walt Whitman was born on May 31, 1819, in West Hills, New York. His parents were of modest means, and he had seven siblings. At the age of 11, Walt Whitman was pulled from school so that he could help the family support itself in the printing industry. As a result, Whitman was largely self-taught. He became a voracious reader. He read widely, especially in novels. When he was 17, Whitman turned to teaching, and his first job was in a one-room schoolhouse. He taught for five years, and then in 1841, he set his sights on journalism. Walt Whitman was a volatile editor and writer. He had strong ideas about women's property rights, about immigration, and about the major issue of the day, slavery. Interesting indeed. Now the website, the WhitmanArchive.org, states that since Whitman was born in 1819, he was amongst the first generation of Americans born in the United States. This may have contributed to his patriotism, although some of that may have come from his parents. Three of Walt's younger brothers were named after presidents, such as Andrew Jefferson Whitman, George Washington Whitman, and Thomas Jefferson Whitman. His father had moved the family to Manhattan whenever Whitman was only four years old in hopes of cashing in on the developing real estate in this city. However, Whitman's father was not successful and soon turned to alcoholism. Oh, so my son told you I was drunk, did he? Bro. They tell you that he's gay. Oh my. Yeah. Preposterous, I say. This is utterly absurd, good sir. No, it's true. He met Peter Doyle whenever he was living in Washington, D.C. Peter would later become his boyfriend. Preposterous. Well, it's true, Mr. Ass. The name is Mr. Arsh. Enough of this. Back to the clip. During the Civil War, Whitman moved to Washington, D.C. to attend his wounded brother, George. See? This is when they met. 
He stayed in D.C. several years, working in the paymaster's office, and volunteered visiting wounded soldiers. When he went to the hospitals, there were limbs piled up outside. He spoke with young soldiers who had witnessed the most astonishing atrocities. From his experience with the wounded during the war, he produced a small book of poems called Drum Taps. This is one of the only two accounts of the Civil War written by people who actually experienced it. Whitman published two new collections of poems in 1870, Democratic Vistas and Passage to India. Whitman was called the bard of democracy because all of his poems are based on the notion of a universal brotherhood. He thought that the possibility of America was to achieve a brotherhood that no other culture had yet been able to achieve. The claim that I would like to make is that perhaps the reason that Whitman wrote poetry differently was simply because he was different. He was a homosexual in an earlier time when people were less tolerant. His lifestyle was that of a man that never married, a lifestyle different than most men of the time. That's what did it, the pure fact that he was someone else. That's why he wrote poetry differently, which developed into free verse. When you ask a dog to moo, it doesn't matter if the dog understands what a moo is. Even if it wants to moo, it's just gonna come out sounding like a bark. That's because a dog is not a cow, it's a different animal. Just like with Whitman, you ask him to write some poetry, and it's not going to rhyme. It's because he's a different creature. From 1848 to 1855, Whitman began what was to become his greatest work, Leaves of Grass. His free verse, his stitching together of encyclopedic lists, completely broke with poetic and literary convention and vastly influenced poets ever after across the world. It began as a book of very few poems and grew to one over the years to contain almost 300 poems. Over his lifetime, he had seven editions of the book. There is an article on the website lgbttoday.com that claims that Peter Doyle may have been Walt Whitman's muse. It said that Whitman falling in love had a powerful impact on his writing. Literary scholars have identified several poems and specific lines from many others that they attribute to Doyle having become the poet's muse. Unfortunately, the two men were never able to live together. They did, however, continue to correspond and visit with each other as well as sometimes vacation together. As the years passed, Whitman continued to revise Leaves of Grass, with the version dated 1882 ultimately becoming the most significant. That edition was published by a prominent Boston firm. Massachusetts state officials soon declared the book obscene because of its references to same-sex love. The obscenity charge attracted national attention, resulting in a plethora of flattering reviews. The Chicago Tribune, for example, called the book brilliant and remarkable. From that point on, Leaves of Grass sold extremely well, and in the words of one biographer, Whitman emerged from the controversy, well paid and famous. For scholars, the strongest impact of the relationship is found in the works Whitman deleted from his 1867 edition. That is, Whitman removed a number of poems that had appeared in the previous edition and that critics characterized as expressing the poet's earlier self-doubt and despair. They say that Whitman eliminated these works because he had now found the love of his life and therefore was in a more optimistic mood. In the words of one scholar, Walt's newfound confidence in love was, in large measure, a result of his satisfying relationship with Pete. The most famous of the works credited to Whitman's relationship with Doyle is his tribute to Abraham Lincoln, O Captain, My Captain. Scholars say Whitman wrote the piece largely because Pete the Great, as Whitman referred to Peter Doyle, had been an eyewitness to Lincoln's assassination in Ford's Theater on April 14, 1865. The second poem that shows Doyle's influence is Come Up From the Fields, Father. The work is unique among the hundreds that Whitman created in that it's the only one that uses a first name, Pete to identify a fictional hero. Well, although you do raise some good points, there is no way to prove your theory, so it is probably wrong.
Whitman suffered a stroke in 1873, leaving him partially paralyzed. He moved to Camden, New Jersey, where he remained until his death on March 26, 1892. In his lifetime, Leaves of Grass was considered by many people to be a disgraceful book. But by the end of his life, he acquired the name The Good Grey Poet, as if America was finally ready in the later years to accept him as a poet. Whitman never really received the attention that he deserved during his lifetime. It was only in the 20th century that we learned how to read his poetry and understand what he accomplished. Interesting. 